Hello, it's Scott Manley here. If there were a greatest hits of Mission Control, then the words set SCE to aux would surely make the cut. A gutsy call by EECOM John Aaron, he basically showed the world what it was to be a steely-eyed missile man. This came during the launch of Apollo 12, crewed by Pete Conrad, Al Bean and Dick Gordon. It launched on November 14th towards the Ocean of Storms and kind of launched into a storm. I mean, it didn't actually launch into a thundercloud, but it was close enough to a thundercloud that the massive rocket and its exhaust trail acted like a lightning rod and... The vehicle was hit by lightning, not once, but twice. First it was hit at 36 seconds, and then 16 seconds later, 52 seconds, it took a second strike. The first strike had the primary effect of causing all three fuel cells to disconnect from the main power bus. Now, the solid state sensors would uh, you know, disconnect these to protect them. And what they saw was that the voltage was rising really rapidly, and I think the threshold was 500 volts per millisecond. So while it never reached like 200 volts, it rose fast enough that these three solid state sensors dropped the fuel cells off the bus, and that left batteries powering everything. Now the command module came with three batteries, A, B and C, but only battery A and B are connected during launch. Battery C is kept disconnected intentionally because they would need that for to have in reserve for re-entry and landing. The switch over from the fuel cells to the battery was a rough affair. Voltage on the DC bus dropped from the designed 28 volts all the way down to 18 volts before it recovered to 24. But this large drop caused a number of electrical devices to basically stop working, you know, put themselves into safe mode, and it caused warning lights of all sorts. In fact, you can hear them reading off the warning lights. I got three fuel cell lights, an AC bus light, a fuel cell disconnect, AC bus overload, one and two, main bus A and B out. The second strike apparently managed to set a number of data lines going into the computer into a state where the computer thought that it needed to realign the inertial guidance platform really quickly. And so what happened was the inertial guidance platform, or rather the artificial horizon that they saw, just started spinning out of control. So the crew were starting to get worried. They saw the thing was spinning and they thought maybe the capsule was, was tumbling off the rocket or something, but then they realized that actually everything felt just fine. I mean, just fine for sitting on top of a 3,000 ton rocket. And indeed, through all of this, the rocket kept flying because all of this drama was really happening in the command module hardware, while the hardware that was controlling the rocket was in the rocket itself. It was the launch vehicle digital computer in the third stage of the Saturn V. This was a completely different computer built by IBM that was unrelated to the Apollo guidance computer in the command module. So while the rocket was still flying a solid course, Mission Control was trying to debug the problem and they couldn't really do much because the telemetry they were getting back from the spacecraft was complete garbage. The numbers were all over the place, it didn't make any sense to them. So, with obvious power problems happening and communications issues, the call went out from the flight director saying, Hey Tom, what do you say? So EECOM is the Electrical, Environmental and Consumables Manager and that seat was John Aaron, who wasn't getting any more useful telemetry information than anyone else, but the garbled data reminded him of a situation he'd seen before. It stirred somewhere in his memory and the suggestion that he came forth with was try setting SCE to AUX. Now SCE to AUX, that's a switch that sits at the bottom of the right hand panel, electrical panel, it has three states. It has normal, off and auxiliary. SCE stands for signal conditioning equipment and this was a box of electronics which was responsible for reading data from a multitude of sensors all over the spacecraft and sometimes polling those sensors. It would then take all this and convert all those voltages which could be all over the place into zero to five volt ranges so that they could then processed and packaged up into nice telemetry packets that could be read by ground control. It was critically important and so it had 
redundant power supplies. The power supplies would take the 28 volt DC uh, power and it would generate 20 volt, 10 volt and 5 volt sources for its electronics. Now the system had sensors that would automatically switch power supplies if one failed. However, in this case, the power bus voltage had dropped and that would affect both power supplies. So switching supplies automatically wouldn't make any difference. The initial voltage drop was quite severe, I mean, down to like 18, 19 volts, and then it recovered to 24 volts, but the hardware had essentially decided to switch itself off. The, the critical value for this was apparently 22.9 volts, but it didn't get up high enough to restart itself automatically because of the undervolt condition on the, the DC bus. So without this working, the spacecraft would be unable to send sensible telemetry back to the ground. And without the telemetry, mission control was going to have a really hard time debugging this problem. And this is where, despite my research, things get a little bit unclear. Because as the story goes, flipping the switch to fix the problem. So I can only imagine that intentionally asking it to switch to the auxiliary power supply got rid of that extra test that checked for the undervolt condition and it began working at 24 volts which was 4 volts below what it was supposed to work. It took John Aaron a minute or so to come up with this recommendation and if you if you listen to the recordings it's clear that this is not something that featured heavily in the training. Between flight, Capcom and the crew they're not sure if it's FCE or SCE or NCE but Alan Bean eventually figured out where the switch was and the telemetry was restored. It only returned about 100 seconds into the flight. So for most of the first stage, the first two minutes of flight, the crew were basically facing a panel with more warning lights than they had seen in any simulation. But in the post-flight briefing, they were very clear that they were doing their best to diagnose the problem and they weren't about to randomly start switching switches to try and fix the problem because they would probably have made it worse. So with the telemetry restored, Mission Control knew that they had to bring the fuel cells back onto the power bus and they radioed that up to the crew. The crew decided to wait until after stage two had uh, separated and ignited. So about two minutes, 22 seconds back in, into the mission, they reconnected the fuel cells. And with the immediate danger dealt with, the crew were heard to speculate that maybe they had been hit by lightning. And they laughed their way into orbit. They said, oh, well, maybe we need some all-weather training. It's really fascinating to listen to this because clearly they were in this moment of extreme drama where they thought the whole mission might go awry, might fail. And after that was dealt with, you can hear that they are so much happier and they are cracking jokes. Hey, that's one of the better sims, believe me. Yeah, yeah. a lot. I'll tell you what happened. We've got a couple of cardiac arrests down here too, Pete. There wasn't any time for that up here. But of course, once they make it to orbit, Mission Control were very concerned about long-lasting effects of this. And they added a whole bunch of extra tests in the orbit while they were preparing for translunar injection. Uh, for example, they dumped like the Apollo Guidance computer memory to make sure that it was all you know, sensible. Since they'd lost the orientation on the inertial guidance platform, they had to realign that multiple times because of course you'd perform an alignment and then you wait a bit and then you do another alignment and that is your drift and then you do another alignment, just checks. And this actually was really hard for them because they were in low earth orbit. They had a bright planet there and they were trying to look at stars. So dark adaptation was a real problem for them to find good stars. But yeah, they got that all aligned and then of course they put the SCE switch back into the normal position because you know, that was the position it was supposed to be in. And from there, yeah, the rest of the mission proceeded pretty much without any trouble. Well, without any other troubles that were related to this. I mean, it's often stated that the spacecraft escaped this uninjured, but truthfully, there were things that were broken. There were five temperature sensors over the, uh, five in the four on the surface and one on a, an instrument. Those were broken. There were, uh, pressure sensors in the reaction control thruster uh, fuel tanks, those were gone. Now, that complicated things, but they had other mechanisms to get the data that these uh, sensors would supply. 
and the Saturn V's launch vehicle guidance, their digital computer, it also showed some transient effects. While it was delivering telemetry via separate channels, it also showed dropouts and you know bizarre numbers. And also the ex one of the accelerometers, they had two accelerometers, and they found that those had got way out of sync. They'd got out of sync by like nine pulses. Um, and they were only supposed to be out of sync by two. So the guidance computer then tries to fix the problem. And what it does is it picks the value which is closest to what it had predicted and then reset the other one. So the LVDC worked as uh, advertised. And so now I want to come back to John Aaron who knew about that magic SCE to AUX switch. It's often misreported that he remembered this from a simulation. But that's not the case because the simulators that they trained on could never have replicated this situation apparently. But he was on the shift in mission control when there was another team doing some tests on a, 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 on a command module capsule, right? And he himself in his oral history interview describes this particular group as not all that, they weren't the A team. <laughs> they'd gotten themselves into a situation where they'd managed to drop all the power from the command module and they were running on batteries and he saw these strange numbers coming back and what he found curious was that they hadn't dropped to zero that they had they were just squirrely were his exact words and after you know they fixed the the problem got it running again those numbers stuck with him and he went back to his office and he, he got together with an engineer from North American Aviation and they tried to figure out where these weird numbers were coming from and they traced it to the signal conditioning equipment and the magic SCE switch. So he was the one that knew this and he may have been the only EECOM to know this, but it's often said that without him, the mission probably would have aborted it. I'm not, I'm not sure on that because it's very clear that the crew were working the problem. They understood that the fuel cells were actually not plugged in. There was some discussion about this. And sure, they would have had to have debugged this while launching with mission control not having proper telemetry. But I think it wouldn't have been such a stretch for them to notice that they needed to bring the fuel cells back onto the bus. And once that happened, they would have got their telemetry back and everything else would have proceeded as normal. And finally, 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 there's one story that I've heard, which I don't know how true it is, but in that first orbit when they were testing everything out to make sure that they were able to go to the moon, there were a number of things that they couldn't test because they didn't have procedures. Some of them were not critical. Some of them could literally kill the crew. One of the ones that could kill the crew if it didn't work were the pyrotechnics on the parachutes. There was no way to test these in space. And so they looked at this problem and they said, well, if the parachutes don't work, they will die when they land. So why don't we send them around the moon first? Because if we come home and they fail, at least, <laughs> at least they'll have gone to the moon and they'll have had a grand adventure before plummeting to their death out without a parachute. I'm not sure how true that is, but it certainly is a sobering thought about the kind of decisions that the people in Mission Control had to make. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.